Welcome to another night of Prophecy Unmasked, the revelation of Jesus Christ. I'm glad you're here. Tonight we're going to be talking about an exciting presentation called Born to Live Forever. And I am glad that you can ex try and find out from God's word the real answer to living forever, not some magical elixir, but instead a connection with Jesus Christ. In El Salvador, there was an earthquake some years ago that immediately killed nearly 3,000 people. It was a really... Um, you can understand how these particular events can be per just really negative for a community. It's so devastating to see all of those people die immediately, just in the, in the blink of an eye. And, and, then, and then there's a desire to, to, to find people who have not died, but are, are somehow buried or, or, or feared lost. And, and, and then there's the unknown, and there's all these concerns. And so people spend a tremendous amount of effort and energy trying to locate people who have been lost during a disaster like this. And, and this, was, this case was very similar. They actually spent uh, more than a week looking for survivors. After four days sifting through rubble, one person saw an arm sticking out of the rubble. And you figure this didn't look like a very good situation, just finding an arm. Clearly, somebody's been covered, but they decided, let's uncover this person anyway. And it turned out that he was alive after four days. And in the hospital, they asked him, how did you, how did you manage to stay alive? He said, I, I just had to. I just couldn't I couldn't bear the thought of death right now. I just kept taking one breath after another, no matter how painful it was, because I just wanted to live. I just wanted to live. That is something that we are all born with a desire for. Life. Almost like dying is unnatural to us. And I would make the argument to you, given what we studied last night, and the introduction of sin to this world, and the fact that that is what brings death. It's that the wages of sin is death. So a sinless world in which humanity was created actually did not know death. Therefore, death, like sin, is a foreigner and an invader in our existence. And humanity has struggled with it and has fought against it for millennia. We are bonded together as human beings as our, our common desire to live. And when human life is threatened, people go to incredible, heroic lengths to try to save others. If a, a, a child is trapped in a burning house, people risk their lives to save that child. If passengers aboard a crippled ship are stranded at sea, great lengths are gone to. A climber is stranded on a dangerous mountainside, the helicopter pilot goes anyway, knowing how hard it is. If victims are trapped in the rubble of an earthquake, we've already heard, people will spend tremendous amounts of man hours hoping that they'll find just one more person is alive. When a life's at risk, people will risk their own lives. Because Death is something that almost everybody universally fears. It, as a human family, death is not something anybody, uh, very few, are actually looking forward to or excited about. Most people are, vi are, are very fearful of that. Now, the good news is, of course, that we know that, that Jesus has actually come to destroy the power of fear of death in our lives. We're not just in danger of death, though. Unless we're connected to Jesus, that is. We're all doomed. <laughs> I mean, just to, 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 to lay it on us pretty heavy right there at the beginning is without Jesus Christ, we really don't have a lot of hope. The Bible makes it very clear that the wages of sin is death. And I'm glad for the second part of that verse. I'm very glad for the second part of that verse, which describes that we can have eternal life as a gift in Jesus Christ our Lord. But naturally speaking, our wages is death. Because sin is poisonous stuff. It's deadly. And why is it lethal? It's because it separates us from the source of all life. Isaiah 59 and verse 2 reads like this. But your iniquities 
have separated you from God. Iniquity is another word for sin. And when you imagine, uh, again, the picture of, of Eden, Adam and Eve are walking in the garden with God, nothing to separate them whatsoever. When sin enters the, the picture, they then have to leave Eden. There is some kind of a separation, some kind of a barrier. They're not able to be in the very presence of God anymore. There's something missing. And Isaiah portrays that as a separation caused by sin. But God wasn't, wasn't wanting to leave it there. He wants to actually fix that separation. We find out that not only are we uh, naturally separated and sentenced to death, but we also all are in this boat. Romans chapter 5 says, Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world. I mean, don't, don't be too disappointed with Adam. I don't know that I would have done any different. Don't be too disappointed with Eve. You know, we all like to say, oh, if I was only in that position, I would, you know, and, and yet, keep reading, because it says, and thus death spread to all men, because, why? All sinned. Yes, yes, sin entered through one man, but then what happened? All sinned. This is very clear as we read through the book of Romans. We find again that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. It is not a... It is not a some here, some there, maybe this one, maybe that one. It, if I was to ask you how many of you are sinners, if you're at all honest, you all ought to at least raise your hand and say, yeah, I, I fall under that category. The Bible has identified me correctly. Sometimes, again, we can be a little stubborn. We can say, no, I'm not that bad. I don't, I, but that's because maybe we don't spend enough time looking at Jesus Christ himself and realizing what a sinless life looks like. My life is not like his. It has not been. And naturally speaking, I, I have struggles, I have temptations, I fall, I'm weak, but we have hope in Jesus Christ. Even though we've all sinned, we have hope. Just to make sure we're all on the same page, though. Romans 3 continues and says, there's none righteous. No, not one. There is none who understands. There's none who seeks after God. They've all turned aside. There is none who does good. No, not one. And so this is just making sure Paul is, is here placing an indictment on the human family. Just making sure that nobody is mistaken and saying, well, I think, you know, I, I, I'm not so bad. I mean, really, I've never, and you can go down the list, right? People might start looking at the checklist and they say, well, I've never, I've never murdered anybody. I've never committed adultery. I've never, and you go down the list and you find, oh, I'm not so bad, right? But we've got to, again, look a little deeper. The, the Bible is very clear. All have sinned. Our original parents, Adam and Eve, chose to, again, introduce that separation as they fell to temptation, as they made decisions and choices. But then we also, as descendants of theirs, make those same choices. And the bad news is that we're all destined to eternal death unless someone saves us. And if that was the end of the presentation, you'd all go away depressed. But it's not. <laughs> Because the great news, the excellent news, is that yes, indeed, God has made salvation possible through Jesus Christ. In Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, it says, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And that's not of yourselves. It's the what? It's the gift of God. We talk about salvation as that gift, that free gift. That is there in Christ Jesus. It's the gift of God. It's not of works, lest anybody should boast. Again, if, if somebody starts to say, I'm not so bad. I think I, maybe I deserve it. Be real clear. Grace is unmerited favor. It's power that comes in the form of forgiveness and the form of, of the ability to overcome in our lives through the power of God. But it's not from us. Grace is not something that we can produce on our own. We cannot expunge the record of our sin on our own. It is through the blood of Jesus Christ that that's going to happen. And so we find that it's, it, it's very important that we recognize that this is an external thing that has to happen. We have to have help. We cannot do this on our own. It's kind of like if somebody has a, a mass and they see that mass and they see it growing and they say, eh, it's probably nothing. And they don't go to the doctor. 
and they never allow anybody to diagnose them. It's fine. And it's growing, and it just looks angry, and it's not. Are they fine? They need to go have somebody look at it. And then that person who has some ability, some expertise, is able to tell them, this is dangerous. This is deadly. This needs to be cut off in many cases. And so while this is not a medical diagnosis we're looking at tonight, we are instead looking at a spiritual diagnosis. All have sinned, which means all of us receive the wages of sin, which is death naturally, unless we have a hope outside of ourselves. Again, we see that, that, that wages of sin being death, if that's all we get, we are in great big trouble. But instead, there's a gift. An excellent, wonderful gift that I hope none of you will turn down. You understand that's what happens with a gift anyway, right? If I was to here offer you a gift tonight, and I don't know whatever it is. Sometimes I like to use the example of a new car. Probably several of you could use a new car. And so, uh, the study Bible. Thank you. That's right. But I'll just go with the new car for now. So, if I have the keys here, the car is sitting in the parking lot right there. And I have, the, and I said, I have this free gift for you. What, what will you do? No? You don't want it? So, so you, it requires a reception, right? It requires a reception. And that is, that is absolutely essential. That's why it's by grace through faith that salvation comes to us. Salvation is a gift. We don't deserve it. We can't earn it. We can't buy it. You can't come to God and you can't say, oh yeah, well I, uh, but look at what I've done, God. Don't I deserve it? it nothing you have done will ever match up with your debt. O only some much larger uh, amount, <laughs> sacrifice, will be able to pay your debt. Yet it is bizarre and, and very interesting. We, we struggle with this. Perhaps you heard somebody say recently that uh, a transactional relationship with God is very natural and normal. Yes? And, and that transactional idea is where, okay, I did this, so now God, you owe me. And so people do this all around the world. They, they, uh, they sit on beds of spikes, believing that torturing their bodies will somehow bring God's approval. They beat or bruise their bodies with whips and chains. They pierce themselves with sharp hooks. Some people walk barefoot over coals, ex searching for some spiritual experience. Some people believe that they gain merit for a future life by building temples or by feeding so-called holy men. Other people believe that if I take some extravagant or, or, or far away kind of, um, what do you call that? Pilgrimage, thank you. Pilgrimage off into the far reaches of the world, then that is when I'm going to somehow be gaining merit with Christ. Not with Christ, with God with the power that is overseeing this world, whatever the case might be. But it turns out that no matter what I do, whether I follow a five-fold path or an eight-fold path, it doesn't matter. Those things that I do will not balance with the sin that is costing me my life, that is bringing me the wages of sin. I'd like to say that this is something that is only outside of the Christian religion, but what you would probably notice if you've been keeping your eyes open or paying attention perhaps to your own uh, relationship with God is that we are tempted as human beings across the world to have this idea that if I just do something, if I just act a certain way, perhaps I attend church Maybe I attend church on the right day. I give offerings. I, I follow the Bible's golden rule. Somehow I'm earning favor with God through my action. But that is just not the picture that we get in the Bible. Man, no matter the amount of physical punishment that he gives himself, the mental anguish he puts himself through, whatever deed of kindness he may do, he cannot bribe God into granting him forgiveness and eternal life. That's not how it works. Instead, we are told again, this is the third time I think we're seeing this, so I'm hoping it's going to start sinking in, right? By grace, you have been saved through faith. 
not of yourselves. He really just repeats this kind of idea again and again. It's not of yourselves. It's the gift of God. It's not of works because we don't want to get things mixed up. It's got to be external. It's got to come from God. Faith, then, is that me putting trust in what God has done. We cannot save ourselves by our own works. We need to depend on God, on his grace, on his love, on his favor, which, by the way, he freely gives to us. That's what that gift is. So why, though? Why, again, just to make sure that we're all, uh, we're all clear again, why would the God of creation not just cast off a rebellious planet and say, you know what? I have limitless power. I can just start over. Why? It's because it's not who he is. That's not who God is. God is pictured several times in 1 John as love. God is love. And, and so love, biblically, is thinking about you. That idea of, well, I'll just do whatever's easier on me. I won't go through the difficulty of, you know, providing salvation through self-sacrifice. I'll instead, I'll just wipe them out and start over. And God, God's like, no, wait, wait, that's not, that's not who I am. That's not me. That's who Satan would like you to believe God is, but that's not who he is. Many of you have children and you recognize that a child who even perhaps through some fault of their own hurts themselves, hurts somebody else, whatever the case might be. I have seen this in my own children. You know, they, 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 I, I tell them, please don't do that. I think you're going to get hurt. And then they persist. They do the thing. And they come to me injured, crying, wailing even. There's gnashing of teeth. It, it's, quite a, it's quite an ordeal. And do you know what? I am not a perfect father, but I have never yet thought, man, I just got to get rid of this kid. <laughs> it's just time to go. I'm not even that good of a father. Is God a better father than me? Of course he is. There has never been a time when God has looked at this rebellious planet and said, you know what? I'm just done with them. I'm so sick of you guys. Aren't you glad? We say that about each other sometimes because we're not as good as God naturally. As, as parents, even pa some parents really mess this up. Some parents in, in, in addressing their children do it in such a terrible way that they give a bad picture of who God is because children look at their parents and they receive their first picture of who God is from them. Yet, friends, God is a much better parent than any of you ever will be or could be or have been. It's just the way it is. And I am so grateful for that. God has never considered walking away. He's never considered just leaving us to die and suffer the results of our rebellion. Do you know, here's why he's never done that. The Lord is long-suffering toward us, Peter says. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Isn't that exciting? Do you know, he could have done that. He could have said, this is just too much effort. I just, I'm tired of these guys. It's like they messed up last week and I forgave them. But then they did it again. You guys ever repeat the same things over and over again? Uh, if you're like me, then you can confess and say, I have had problems that are recurrent. And I'm like, oh God, I don't want to. And I'm thankful that he's putting that, that enmity between me and, 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 and Satan that he promised he would do in uh, Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. And, and yet, never once, when I come to him begging for mercy, has he said, get out of here. You ask one too many times. It's just not how he feels. It, regardless of how good or bad you may be or think you are, 
God loves you and wants to save you. He is not willing that you should die. He wants to see you come to repentance. Yeah, it's true that you do deserve death, but that's not what God wants to give you. He wants to give you a free gift of eternal life. You know, it's interesting because even in our own lands, if somebody breaks the law, there are consequences. And our laws are not perfect. The law of God, the Bible describes as perfect. And so how much more true of God's government that there, there should be, and there are consequences for sin. And yet, even though his justice is that much more pure than the justice of this world, he still does not immediately rain it down upon us because of his love, because of his mercy, because of his desire to give us probation, a time to accept the free gift of salvation that he wants to give us. And he does this, in particular, because the accusations leveled against him by Satan have brought a lot of the ideas of his government into question. Whether or not, uh, you know, he, he actually is who he says he is. And he's, he's showing, he's showing the world, he's showing the universe exactly who he is by going through the process of salvation because of the love he has for you. On Mount Sinai, he described himself like this. He puts the two ideas together and he says, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth. That, that's, this is a God's self-description. He's saying, look, you want to know who I am? This is who I am. Merciful and gracious, long-suffering, abounding in goodness and truth. I keep mercy for thousands. I forgive iniquity and transgression and sin. Hallelujah! <laughs> this is amazing. Now, the last line, I don't want you to miss it, but I don't clear the guilty. I don't pass over those kinds of things unless you've been cleansed. That's the kind of idea. The, the, is it true that you're guilty? Yes. But what happens to your guilt when you come to Jesus Christ? That guilt is expunged from the heavenly record. It's gone. It's no more. God forgives and cleanses, and he does it because of his great love for us, that most famous and most memorized Bible verse, I think probably world round, John 3, 16 says, for God so loved the world. That's what motivated him, that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes may not perish, right? That's what we naturally deserve. The wages of sin is death. But instead of that, instead of perishing, he wants to give us eternal life. This shows up again and again and again in the Bible, that this is God's goal for us, and he's motivated because of his love. Jesus came to earth to live his life as a man, facing the same difficulties and, tr and trials and struggles that you and I face. Not only so he could perhaps set us an example, but so he could actually fulfill the requirement of the law, show that God is just, and that he is also a God of love who wants to apply Jesus' righteousness to our lives. And forgive our sins. This is, again, how Paul paints it in Romans 5, 19. He says, yes, it's true that by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. So also by one man's obedience, that one man is Jesus Christ. Many will be made righteous. I am so thankful that the scriptures reveal that we, yes, we're sinners, but that there is hope, friends, because we have a wonderful Savior. You know, all throughout the Old Testament, this was also clear that this was the, the, the direction God was going. There were daily symbols that the people of Israel had that pointed them to a God who would make a sacrifice, who would actually, who wanted to get rid of their sin. And when somebody would sin, they would bring a sacrifice. Uh, again, hopefully realizing the symbolism, but many times I'm sure they did not. Bringing that symbolism, and they, they laid that offering down, they placed their hand upon the animal and they confessed their sin, symbolically transferring the sin to the animal. Who does the animal represent, friends? We already read last night that Jesus is the Lamb of God which takes away the sin of the world. That animal then died symbolically again because of the sin. This, friends, is an amazing picture. 
And so we understand that this is actually fulfilled in Jesus Christ as John pointed to him and said, look, guys, he's the Lamb of God. And he's taking away the sin of the world. This is amazing what Peter says here then. It's because he who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth. He was the perfect lamb. The perfect lamb. The perfect sacrifice. We understand that it was not, it was not the animals that were bringing uh, reconciliation between God and man. But that they were just a symbol pointing forward to the sacrifice that Jesus would make as he was crucified. Now, look, he could have resisted. He could have. He said himself, I could call a legion of angels that would fight on my behalf. Peter, you can put away your sword. You're bad at it anyway, right? But really, I, I, that's, this is why I'm here, because I'm, I actually want to sacrifice myself. I want to give of myself so that you may have hope. And so we are told that God placed upon him the sins of the whole world, and he then died as a result of that. You remember what sin brings. We read in Isaiah 59 two earlier, sin brings separation. And so as he is there on the cross, he's crying out, uh, uh, feeling the weight of the, the sins of the world. This is not just the sins of one man. Have any of you ever experienced the weight of your own sin and just realized the enormity of it and felt like it was going to just crush you, like you were just, you had no hope until Jesus Christ showed you that he can take your burden. He's not bearing the sin of one man. He's bearing the sin of the history of mankind. All humanity. And that, friends, is what finally crushed out his life. It was not the crucifixion that killed him. He died way too quickly for the crucifixion to have been what killed him. He died because sin crushed out his life and he was separated from the Father. Never before did that happen. And that is, can you imagine the agony of that separation as they had been together forever? It's breaking both of their hearts. What are they going to do? And as he, as he was on the cross, people came and mocked him and said, he saved others. Why doesn't he save himself? And they didn't realize that what they were saying was an impossibility. The only way he could save others was to resist saving himself. To save himself would have been an act of selfishness. It would have been the opposite of love. But he's revealing the character of God by staying there. He stayed there. He, he bore the weight of your sin and mine so that we could actually be saved. So when they mocked him and said, he saved others, and you just say hallelujah, because that's me. You're the others. Yeah, they were talking about the people that he had maybe healed from leprosy or, or cured their blindness or some disease or malady. But the words are almost prophetic in themselves. Others. Who are the others that he's always concerned about? It's you. It's you. Because God is love. He's, he, he says, I, I don't want them to go out this way. I don't want them to receive the wages of sin. I want to give them a gift of eternal life in Jesus Christ. Friends, it's very exciting. Again, we read, it's by grace that you've been saved. It's an amazing feeling when you actually recognize that, that he bore your sins as well. Do you know what that often breeds in people? Well, John says we love him because he first loved us. When you see his love displayed in his, in his life and in his actions, especially at, as he sacrificed himself on the cross, you say, man, that is amazing. And it breeds within us not just love, but trust. This, this picture of faith here given that makes this meaningful in our lives, that makes the grace offered meaningful, is, is a putting our trust in what he has done. Further in Acts, uh, as uh, Paul was addressing the Philippian jailer, he's saying, what should I do to be saved? 
Paul just says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Believe. But again, we understand, you understand and I understand, that it's not just a simple mental assent. It's not just me saying, yeah, I get it. Okay, I agree. Jesus was the Son of God. Jesus made that sacrifice for me. It's not just a mental thing. It is further than that. It is actually me saying, I trust that it was for me. Do you know, in the Bible, James says something very strange about belief. He says, did the, the, the demons believe? There's nothing special about mental assent to the truth. To say, yeah, I recognize that that's true. Even the demons believe and tremble. Beyond that, what else is there? The Bible encourages us to go beyond simple mental assent, but rather to, as my grandfather's favorite Bible verse says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge God and he will direct your paths. Friends, the belief moves beyond that simple mental ascent when it becomes trust. Trust is seen in our lives through action. That is what is so meaningful. That's, what, that's when, when, when salvation comes home to you, it is transformational. It is. And I've seen it in so many lives. And so, friends, this is what God is calling us to. He's calling us to trust, to put our hearts on his side. The question still remains, though. Many people, unsure, feeling like they don't know what to do with the idea of salvation. What must I do to be saved? And so we're going to look at a few facts from the Bible that you could share with a friend that would be very important for us to understand. Just four short facts that will help to describe the idea of salvation to someone. Fact number one, I think this might be the fifth time we've seen this verse. So it's got to be getting in there now, right? There's a great memory verse for you. But fact number one is that salvation is a free gift. It says there in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 9, For by grace you've been saved through faith. And that's not of yourselves. It's a, what's the word? Gift. It's a gift of God. It's a gift of God. Fact number one is that salvation is a gift. <clears throat> you cannot earn it. A gift, by definition, is something that is given. If you had to work for it, it's called wages. <laughs> right? Make sure, you know, ki kids, sometimes we do this with kids, and we say, oh, you know, if you do this and this and this and this, then I'll get you a gift. Well, that's not a gift. That's called payment. <laughs> right? For work done. I mean, how would you feel if your, your boss called you into the office, you know, at the end of the day on Friday as you're getting ready to go home and said, I've got a gift for you. You're going to love it. It's wonderful. And then you're thinking, oh, that's good. It got me up. I've got a bonus. I, I have been working hard. And so here we go. Great. They finally recognized it. And you go into the office and the boss says, this is for you. It's an envelope. And you're, yes, finally. I, I, did, need, I did need a little extra this week. Great. And you open it up, and it is your paycheck. And you, think, you look at the box. You say, Excuse me? Excuse me? I, I worked for this. Lest any should boast. It's a gift, friends. Don't, don't get mixed up. You can't work for it. It's impossible. And it's impossible because... You're a sinner. <laughs> you can't work for it. You can't earn it. There's nothing you could do that would match up to that. Fact number two is that all of us are in this boat. Every single one of us are, are included in that Romans chapter three, chapter 3, verse 23, which says, All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Every single one of us. There is not one friend that you will ever talk to who will not fall under this category. And so if they're wondering, and you're talking to them, and they say, Well, I don't, I don't feel so. I'm not, uh, uh, that's not for me. You say, are you part of all? Be yeah, you are. 
And it's very important that people recognize this because if we don't recognize it, then we won't seek the cure. We must recognize that. Fact number three is very simple as well. Sin means death. Sin means death. The wages of sin is death. It's a plain picture given in the Bible. It, and it's because of sin that death even exists in our world. This is a foreigner. It's an invader. Sin is and death is. These are not part of God's creation. They are not pictured as something that God planned. And this is why I just I cringe every time there is a funeral and some well-meaning individual comes up to the family and says, don't worry, God has a plan. And if they mean by that, that God can take any bad thing and turn it into something good, which Romans chapter 8 verse 28 might indicate, then great. But most of the time it's understood that somehow God has a plan in this, that this is good for, this is somehow good. Tell that to a child the next time they lose, lose a parent, or a parent the next time they lose a child. Don't worry, God has a plan. And I'm not going to defend you if you get smacked. <laughs> because it's not right. This is not God's plan. His plan is not for, for innocent people to die. His plan is that all should come to repentance. That's his plan. So I know it, it, I, if you've ever said that, I, just, just change the, the terminology a little bit, right? Ex explain a, a little bit deeper. Comfort, yes, but, but try not to comfort with that idea because it just isn't, it doesn't give a good picture of who God is. It's not a biblical picture because the biblical picture lines up with fact number four, which is that God has provided a solution. The solution is Jesus. <laughs> it says there simply in Romans chapter five, verse eight, God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Get the meaning. God is not waiting for you to ascend certain rungs of the ladder before you may be offered salvation. While you were in the depths of sin, Christ gave his life for you. He did not wait for you to be good enough. He'd be waiting a long time, friends. He's the only way you can be good enough to even present yourself before God. It is only in him that we have any safety. And so, friends, just know that this is the solution. And please, by all means, as you present these ideas to somebody, do it with the love that God has for them. The four simple facts are very, uh, uh, again, they're simple because it, you could remember them tonight. One, two, and three are easy. Salvation is a free gift. All of us need the gift because we've all sinned. And the problem is that sin leads to death. And so you definitely want the gift. And the solution is that Jesus died for us, which means we have life as we accept him as our Savior. And, and so that question, how may I obtain eternal life? How may I be saved? It's simple. Receive Jesus into your life. How can you receive the free gift? Jesus says it plainly there in Revelation chapter 3 verse 20. He is standing at the door and he is knocking. He's not busting it in because that's not who God is. He's the God of love, so he gives choice. We talked about that on another night. At the same time, he's saying, but please, but please open the door because I don't want you to die. I love you. Do you know as he addresses uh, the, the, the people of Israel in the Old Testament, in Ezekiel, he looks at them and he says, why will you die, O house of Israel? He's asking the question, like, what's, wh I don't understand. It's almost like he's incredulous at their choices because they, they continue to persist in sin. And he is just flabbergasted. Why? why? I am making everything possible for you. Why would you die? Don't do it. And he could say the same thing to us tonight, friends. Don't do it. Accept the free gift. 
a couple of things happen as we are accepting the free gift, as we're receiving Jesus into our lives. The first one that is amazing is that we, uh, we, we sense a great need of our sin. As you draw near to Jesus, you see your own imperfections very clearly. I, I recommend if you ever are feeling like you're just doing all right, you know, go buddy up to Jesus for a little bit and realize that in, in light of his perfect life, our righteousness is, as Isaiah says, filthy rags. And, and so something happens when we do get near to Jesus. It, we, we have a desire to confess our great need. John says in 1 John chapter 1 and verse 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just. Remember we talked about he's a just God? How is he going to do this? He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I am so excited about that, guys. You don't deserve it. Neither do I. But he's going to do it because he loves you. And he's still going to be just in doing it. He is still a righteous God. Satan says, oh, it's not, it's not fair. You can't do that. You can't forgive them and be just. And God says, watch me do it. <laughs> watch me. I am going to pay the price myself so that I can offer it to them. Oh, man, what a God. Later in the same book, John says, he who believes in the Son of God has the witness in himself. He who does not believe God has made him a liar because he does not believe the testimony that God has given of his son. This is interesting. Basically, we get down to that same question again. Do you believe God? When you read his word, do you believe him? There's a story that I heard an evangelist tell one time of a visit he had with an older lady who came to him just in tears. Oh, pastor, what am I going to do? I just feel so bad. I, you know, I, I don't know if God can accept me. I've... I've, I've lived for 50 years with the weight of sin in my life that, I, that I, I feel is unforgiven. And the pastor simply turned to 1 John chapter 1 and verse 9 and said, Sister, have you confessed your sin? Oh, oh, pastor, every day for the past 50 years. And the answer was simple. Oh, you think God's a liar? Oh, <laughs> no, pastor, no. I don't think God's a liar. Well, well, sure you must because his word says that if you confess, what does he do? He forgives and cleanses. So is that sin forgiven or not? If you've confessed and you believe, you have that witness within yourself that says, look, I don't deserve this, but God has forgiven me. I am a partaker of salvation, not because of anything good I've done, but because of Jesus Christ. And I'm thankful. And my life reflects it. If not, you know, I can just disbelieve and continue to press on. And by my actions then, I, 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 I'm showing that I don't believe God. In addition to confessing, there's something interesting else that happens in our lives. This idea of repentance comes up. In Acts chapter 3 verse 19, uh, the call is made. To repent, therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out. How many of you would like your sins blotted out tonight? I would like that very much. And so the instruction is then given to repent. Well, what is repentance? It's very simple. You're walking this way. This way is leading to sin and death. And God says, through the, uh, either through some well-meaning individual, or perhaps through his word, or perhaps through the, the voice of his Holy Spirit to your heart, he says, that's the way that's leading to death. And over there, that's the way that's leading to life. That's where you're connected to Jesus Christ. So what do you want to do? Can I help you? Can I give you the power needed to make a change, to turn around? And what are you going to do? Oh, what did I just do? I repented. Repentance is simply turning away from that to that. It's a change of directions. It's a change of directions, friends. And that is what God is calling each and every one of us to do. Now, look, he's not expecting you to do it on your own. He gives you the power to do these things. That's what the Bible indicates for us. It is, and we heard that again recently, that it is through the, the blood of the Lamb and through our testimony that we are overcomers. 
that is an absolutely essential and beautiful thing that we recognize because God doesn't want us to continue in sin, to continue that direction because he knows that sin brings pain, suffering, and death. And he loves you. And so he says, cut it out. (laughs) You know, by my strength, by my power, can you please go back the other way towards me? I would love that. Come walk with me. That's what we want to do. That's what we, every one of us, wants that overcoming power. I believe it. And the Bible says very plainly, John chapter 1, verse 12, as many as received him, Jesus Christ, to them he gave the right, some versions say the power, to become children of God to those who believe on his name. Again, when we believe, when we're putting our faith and our trust in him, when we actually receive him into our lives, something changes. We are no longer in Satan's kingdom. We're no longer controlled by him. We have changed teams. Amen. (laughs) We have changed teams. And and you know what? Your life is going to be different because of the change of teams. We're no longer children of darkness, but we're children of God. He gives us the power to walk in his footsteps. As we believe in him, we accept the gift of salvation, and he gives us the power to be overcomers. And if you stumble and fall, let's say you're walking this way, and you stumble and fall, what should you do? Get up and keep walking. That that way, right? Now look, what's tricky and what the devil would love you to do, right after he trips you and you fall on your face, he says, you're no good. You can't keep going that way. If you get up at all, you might as well go that way. And a lot of people do. A lot of people just keep going that way. But the Bible is very clear that a righteous man falls seven times. But guess what he does? He gets up every time and just keeps going. Keep pressing on. Go to God again. Confess. What's he going to do? Forgive and cleanse. Guys, this is not. We make it harder than it needs to be sometimes. When we hear that knocking at the door, what are you supposed to do? Answer the door. (laughs) Invite him in. This is what's amazing. When we receive Jesus, that's when we receive salvation. A lot of times we think of salvation as a, as a, a, some thing that we get, but it's not. It's a connection with Jesus. That's what we're after. This verse here in 1 John chapter 5 and verse 12 says, he who has the son has life. Friends, This is salvation, not some thing that God gives you, but someone, a connection with Jesus Christ. If you have the Son, you have life. And the other part of the verse is just as equally true. If you don't have the Son, you don't have life. So what do you want? The Son. (laughs) You want the Son. Because that, you, I know you want life. But you really, that means you want the Son. Oh, man, guys, this is, this is what we want. And in that next verse, the very next verse, right after he says, whoever has a Son has life, he says, these things I've written to you so that you may believe in the name of the Son of God and so that you may, so that you may what? So that you may know that you have eternal life. Does God want you to be constantly uh, waffling back and forth without some kind of assurance that he, that through that connection with the son, that you can confidently say, I have life, not because of anything I've done, not because how good I am. That's not why. But I actually know I have eternal life because of my connection with Jesus Christ. Because if I have the son, I have life. I guess the question is, do you have the son tonight, right? That's the question. Because if, if you do, you believe, you're not going to perish, but you're going to have everlasting life. There's a, a story um, that comes to us from way back ancient times. Uh, December 31, 1995. A gentleman named John Clancy, who was a veteran firefighter in New York. They got a call Uh, where they were called to an abandoned apartment building. This apartment building was, you know, it was one of those older, run-down kind of buildings, needed to be torn down sort of thing. 
um, that there was a fire in the building. And the firemen knew that there were various unsavory characters who still called that building home. And so they, uh, uh, they recognized that, yes, they might be uh, vagrants, drug addicts, alcoholics, or prostitutes and the like who were living in this building, but, but they're humans, and there's life in there. And so as people who are trained to preserve life or save life, you might say, they actually went right in. And, and John Clancy, upon spending a great deal of time in this building, actually uh, died in the building, leaving a six-month-old baby and his wife to survive him. That's pretty disappointing. Why would he do that? Why would he do that? And to make it even worse, it later came out through investigation that one of those vagrants, as it were, had set the fire. He's going in to save people who literally got themselves into that situation. What a picture of Jesus Christ. I mean, I, I, I think this is amazing because we are literally living in a, an apartment building, a run-down one at that, that is, is coming down around us. It's on fire. And we're the ones who set the fire. And Jesus is like, hang on. Wait a minute. I'm going to leave the glories of heaven, the, the, the adoration of the angels. I'm going to leave everything. I'm going to leave the Father's side. And I'm going to go and risk everything so that I can save them. And as somebody living in that building, I am so grateful. I am so grateful. He is, he is listening and he is waiting for us to basically respond. You know, that's what, that's what this is about, right? When he's knocking at the door, what are we going to do? So I guess maybe I could ask um, Morgan and Warren to come up and help me real quick. I've got some cards up here that I was hoping you could pass out and share, and maybe you could, you could come up and, and, and play a little music while we're thinking this card through for a minute. There's some cards and some pens there. You could pass those out for me. I'd appreciate it very much. Because we want to actually have an opportunity to respond. Sometimes we just let these moments pass us by a little bit. And so we're just going to pass these out real quick. And we're going to read through a couple of these questions. Quick, quick, quick. Ready, set, go. I know I put you on the spot. God bless you. I appreciate you. And as you are, are getting that card, I want you to think about what uh, the card is asking and what really, um, what the indication is that is in your heart as you want to respond in whatever way you are hoping to do that. So I'm going to look here as you're receiving the card. The first line says simply, it is clear to me that Jesus' death provides the free gift of eternal life for all who believe. That is an, a really important thing. If it's not clear tonight that that is the truth, then don't mark that because I need to know that there was a lack of clarity. That is really important. If it is clear, though, that Jesus' death provides the gift of eternal life for all who believe, and there's a couple more that need to go in the back there. Ms. Myrna's got a couple more there. If it's clear, then I want you to just check that first box. Now, the next box is kind of an interesting one. It says simply, I have never accepted Jesus as my personal Savior. But today... I choose to accept his forgiveness for my sins and invite him to be the Lord of my life. If you've never accepted Jesus, but in, in hearing the proclamation of the good news of what he's done for us, you say, man, I do want that. I do want that. Then go ahead and check that. The third box says, I've wandered away from my walk with Jesus. This is just me taking stock of myself now. And I want to once again accept him as my Savior and Lord and return to a loving relationship with him. 
if that's if that describes you and you just want to tell him and have, have I, we'll be praying for you if you're marking these things you check that one that means yep that's that's me but I don't want to I don't want to wander anymore I'm gonna walk with him the fourth box says I already trust in Jesus as my Savior but today I want to renew my surrender you understand this is not a one-time thing it's a day-by-day -day walk with Jesus. I want to renew my surrender and commitment to him for his amazing love. I already trust him, but I want to renew my surrender. That's box four. And the last one says, I would love to have more some reading material on how to grow in Jesus. This might come in the form of a book or a Bible study or DVD or something like that. But you're saying, I, I, I want more information. I'd love to continue to think about this because the truth changes you when it has your attention but I know there's a temptation that when you walk out tonight you, you move on to the next topic but I don't want you to do that I want you to keep thinking about this day by day and say God I want you in my life and so we are actually going to we're going to invite uh, Lucas to come on up and sing our appeal song as you're thinking about this you're reading what the card says there I just want you to think about the words here that Jesus has become our champion. This is a very exciting thing that he has done on our behalf. And I am, I, I, again, I love this song. I hope that you will appreciate it as well because Jesus wants to be your champion as well. <clears throat> Gentlemen, may I have your attention? I want to introduce to you in this corner of the good and the right stands a champion robed in white. His height exceeds the heavens. His weight outweighs the world. His reach reaches everywhere. His age is evermore. He is higher than the highest, greater than the great. No one will ever take his power away. He's more mighty than the mightiest, and he reigns from above.
exciting thing to know Jesus. I want to invite you to make sure your name is on your card. You can drop it at the registration table on your way out, but let's close with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, I am so grateful again that you have revealed yourself as the champion of love. And you have conquered by that love. You have cast out doubt from our hearts and our minds. You have won the day. You've revealed your love through Jesus Christ. And we today are just saying thank you and receiving Jesus into our lives by your invitation. God, when we receive Jesus, we understand that we receive eternal life. We don't deserve it, but we say thank you. Lord, if, if ever anyone asks us about the hope that we have in Jesus, I pray that we would remember this, this simple idea, these simple facts that we found in the Bible tonight. We understand that prophecy gives us a firm foundation, but then we need to believe and have tr actually trust. And so, God, thank you for presenting it to us in your word clearly. We do respond in love upon seeing your great love for us. 